And in preparing these lectures, I was thinking back um, to how much things have changed and how much they've stayed the same since I was in your position, sitting in uh, summer schools as a graduate student. Um, and Natty actually did a nice job of summarizing the fact that a lot has changed in both the theory and experiment. So experimentally, we know a lot more. Um, I'm almost embarrassed to go down a list of all the things we didn't know when I was a graduate student. We hadn't even discovered the top quark yet. That's, that's how old I am. Um, and in theory, we've learned lots of, made, you know, lots of good, important progress has been made in understanding fundamental physics on the theory side. But one thing that um, has uh, been a roadblock to extending our understanding of fundamental physics to distance scales shorter than the electroweak scale is any access experimentally to the Higgs sector. So the standard model has three sectors. It has a gauge sector, a Yukawa sector, and a Higgs sector. And the first two of those have been tested now to very good precision in various ways uh, experimentally. But up until just over a year ago, as you know, we didn't have almost any information about the Higgs sector. And so now is the time when we finally have, as a community, we have the instrument, the LHC, with these fantastic detectors that has the energy and the collision energy and the um, uh, level of technology in the detectors to um, finally access this this sector. And so we're at a point now where resonant production of single particles through gluon fusion that can be produced through a loop like the Higgs, there's, there's enough uh, cross-section and integrated luminosity now to see that. And also, interestingly, there's enough cross-section and integrated luminosity now to see pair production of weakly produced particles. And although, as theorists, we like to understand all these problems that we've heard about related to the hierarchy problem this morning, the only thing that we know for sure about the weak sector, uh, of any, new phys any physics at the weak scale, is we know that there's a Higgs sector there. And we know it has um, weak interactions. And we know at least one mass scale in the Higgs sector. It's the 1 to 200 GeV range. The W, Z, Higgs, and top all have a mass in this range. So there is a mass scale of the 1 to 200 GeV scale in the Higgs sector. There are, by definition, weak interactions in that sector. And just now, with um, as much integrated luminosity as we have, we've finally gotten to the point that that can be accessed experimentally. So I think it's really an exciting time. And um, <clears throat> so you'll see that reflected through many of the talks and the connection with the Higgs sector and the Higgs boson uh, in many of the talks in the school. And so I'm going to give introductory lectures on Higgs theory. So these lectures will just be introductory in nature. Uh, it'll be from a low energy point of view. Um, and most of it will be uh, background, or some of it will be background and context for um, Chris Tully and the other experimental lectures that'll come later in the school. I won't be discussing any UV completions of the Higgs sector. That's not because I don't think that's important. I actually spend much of my time thinking about such things, but that'll be covered by other lecturers. And I'm also not going to try to get any of the history correct of the theoretical ideas that went into the electroweak symmetry breaking. So I won't be giving any references. OK, now there are many aspects of electroweak symmetry breaking and terminology that goes along with it. There's Higgs mechanism, Higgs phase, Higgs boson, spontaneously broken symmetry, hidden symmetry, order parameter, gauge bosons eating Goldstone bosons, and so forth. So to start this discussion, to explain some of this terminology and some of the aspects that go into this, uh, we'll consider a simple example. We'll just take the standard model in the phase that we see it, namely that there are Um, four point-like spin-1 particles that we observe. There are other spin-1 massive particles, like the rho, the phi, j psi, and so forth. But those we know are not point-like. They're composites made out of uh, quark-antiquark pairs. <coughs> These bosons are different, though. The first three are massive, and the photon is massless. 
and experimentally, these appear to be completely point-like. And so the standard model, the gauge sector of the standard model, describes the interactions of these spin-1 particles. And it describes them to very good accuracy, and, it's, and that accuracy has been tested now in many, many experiments in many ways. So um, let's ask the, ah, and for the, uh, it's an explained in terms of the, the local gauge theory that for these bosons is SU2 cross U1. And just empirically, the physical Z and photon are some linear combination of one of the components of the gauge boson in the SU2 group and the hypercharged gauge boson. So we'll come back to this mixing angle later in the talk. And the process to illustrate these things, uh, illustrate some important concepts in the Higgs sector that we'll look at is two to two scattering of W bosons. So two, two W bosons in to two, two W bosons out. Now, the um, gauge interactions, this gauge theory, the interactions are, again, well described, so we'll just use those. And although in this local Lagrangian description that has a gauge invariance, writing a mass term for these massive things breaks the gauge symmetry, let's just be bold and write down a mass term and start calculating. And often that's a good thing to do. The history of the standard model has lots of examples like that where people at some point when they were trying to uh, develop ideas, all the ideas weren't worked out yet, and it wasn't really clear what to do. And so, well, in this case, if we want to calculate the scattering of these things, these things have a mass. So let's just write a mass term down and calculate and see what happens, even though let's just be bold. So we'll take the usual standard model interactions that are there when these things are massless and just add mass terms, appropriate mass terms. for the gauge fields and start calculating. So there are a number of types of diagrams that contribute to this process. So here are some of them. So from the non-abelian interaction, there's a four-point interaction between four W bosons. And there are T-channel, uh, sorry, S-channel and T-channel exchange of uh, the other gauge, the neutral gauge bosons, so the photon and the Z and the photon and the Z. So the diagrams are of this type. Now to analyze this scattering, for two to two unpolarized scattering, so if we have one particle in, sorry, two particles in in the center of mass frame, then, um, neglecting the spins or averaging over the spins, the whole scattering process can be described just by the center of mass scattering angle. So in particular, then, we can expand the amplitude or the cross-section in a complete basis of functions that describe the uh, center of mass scattering angle dependence. So we can write the amplitude in general like this. So if we pick a basis to be the Legendre functions, so these normalizations are just for later convenience, times some amplitude. So there's a scattering amplitude in each partial wave described by the L quantum number with some, number, some complex number here that describes the scattering in that partial wave. Now, it turns out unitarity gives a restriction on the range, so this is a complex number, the range that this scattering amplitude in each partial wave can take. So let's derive what that is. So the S matrix that takes us from initial states to final states, in order to conserve probability, then the norm on the initial states and the in states and the out states have to be the same. So if we think of S as a matrix, then that means the matrix has to be unitary. 
Okay, so conservation of probability means that the scattering matrix is a unitary, as a, thought of as a matrix is unitary. Now we usually write the, um, we can write the S matrix as the case with no scattering plus a transition matrix element that has non-trivial, so this is when the particles pass each other without any collisions, this is when the, they're non-trivial collisions. <coughs> And so writing it like that, the unitarity of the S matrix then implies a interesting nonlinear condition on the transition matrix element, which is the following. So it says twice the imaginary part of the transition matrix element has to be equal to its modulus squared. So if I draw a picture for that, so for our case in two to two scattering, That means twice the two to two scattering amplitude, many point. Now this matrix multiplication, there's an infinite number of states here, and so what this multiplication means is really that we sum over all um, intermediate states that can be put in here. So unitarity gives a relation between the imaginary part of the scattering matrix and then this, this integral over intermediate states of the scattering matrix squared. And if we consider the case where these two states are the same state, so I'll call these initial and these final, then the thing on the right-hand side of the equation we recognize as being proportional to the total cross-section. Because here, this is, if we just look at half of this, this is the matrix element for some initial state to scatter into any possible final state, because we integrated over all final states. And then we squared that. And that thing squared is proportional to the cross-section. So that tells us that the, so this is the optical theorem. So restricted to these cases, this is the optical theorem. So that tells us that the forward scattering matrix element for two to two scattering is proportional to the total cross-section for two to all. And so we want to put in the right constant of proportionality. Then what we find is that the imaginary part of the scattering amplitude for two to two is equal to S, the cross-section of two to all. Now this is, the two to all cross section is by definition bigger than the two to two cross section. So that gives us an inequality between matrix elements just for two to two um, processes. And since we did a partial wave decomposition of the amplitude, well we can do that for any quantity including the cross section. So if we calculate the two to two cross section and decompose it in partial waves, And in the normalization I gave above, it's proportional to the amplitude, partial wave amplitude with some normalization in each partial wave summed over all the partial waves. So plugging this in here, then that gives us an inequality that the um, scattering amplitude in each partial wave has to satisfy, and that is that the magnitude in each partial wave has to be less than the imaginary component. So in the complex, now again, this is a, this is a full non-perturbative result. There's no approximation or perturbation theory or anything here. Um, and notice in the case that the scattering is completely elastic, so that this would be an equality, so that there's only the two-body final state, so it's elastic scattering, then this would be an equality. So in the complex plane, for each partial wave, this condition is a circular region here where this height is one, and well, I didn't draw it very well. This comes out to a half. So elastic scattering, each partial wave has to live on the circle, and in general, when there's other, other final states, then the amplitude has to live inside that region somewhere. Okay, so that's the optical theorem for two-body scattering, and we can use that 
uh, bound, this unitarity bound, to find something interesting about our calculation here. So let's calculate then the L equals zero. So for the restriction we're about to get, that's the most restrictive case. So when we do this calculation here, again, just take our standard model, turn, just put in mass terms by hand, do the calculation at tree level, then the amplitude in the L equals zero partial wave is the following. So it goes like G squared. We can see that from the Feynman diagrams here because there's two powers of gauge coupling in each of these interactions. Um, and it turns out it grows like the um, energy, center of mass energy squared. So that's the important part here. But it grows like S. So clearly this tree level calculation, at some point this A will become so big that it will violate this unitarity bound. Okay? So that can't be. And we can see at what scale that is. And so if we plug in numbers here for, if we require, so here, this is, this is real at tree level, this is completely real, so the condition on the real part is that the magnitude of the real part is less than or equal to a half of <coughs> the scattering amplitude. So the gauge coupling is, for W bosons, is about 0.6. The, the W mass is 80 GeV. And so this calculation becomes bad when S is about 1.7 TeV. So something interesting happens at that scale. The theory that I, that I suggested to do the calculation is, has, has, at least at tree level, the calculation doesn't make any sense anymore. Now, one comment that, or one thing that you might say initially as well, okay, you just did a tree level calculation, calculate loops. I don't know, maybe the loops uh, will fix it. But we can see that it's not going to be um, just usual gauge interaction loops by taking a particular limit. So if we take the following limit, if we take g squared to 0 and mw to 0, holding the ratio g squared over mw squared fixed, then this tree level calculation doesn't change because I held this ratio g squared over mw fixed. But um, a naive expectation for what the corrections for the loops, if we just counted powers of g, so loop corrections come with powers of g squared over 16 pi squared to the number of loops. And so I can, so the, so the naive expectation, I can send these to zero in this limit, but this problem remains. So there's at least a limit where we can see that there's an inch. So something still is interesting going on. It's not just as trivial as well. There's, there's standard loops in the theory, and, and uh, that's what's wrong. Now, to expose what's wrong in this calculation, let's look at the polarization vectors. of the W bosons. So a polarization vector for a massive spin one field, there are three polarization states. So that just means it can point in any of the three directions. So if you go to its rest frame, it's a vector, it's a three vector in its rest frame, so it can point in any direction. So there's three independent polarization states, and they have to satisfy. So if epsilon of the polarization vectors, they have to be um, space-like, and so just translating from the rest frame to a general frame, they have to satisfy this condition. Okay, so in, in the rest frame, it's just a, any basis vectors you like. But now here in this limit that we took, the problem is at large s. So that means that, in, and particularly if I take this limit, the W bosons are very light. So in the center of mass scattering frame, they're coming at each other with very high energy. So if we consider the polarization vectors in the center of mass frame, then um, we have to take these rest frame polarization vectors and boost them to the, to a, 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 the center of mass frame. 
And so when we do that, if we boost along some particular axis, let's call it the z-axis, Yes. Um, yes, but when we do, when we put loops in, the imaginary part uh, won't remain zero. Okay. So this is a, so you're right, if we do a refined calculation at any order in perturbation theory, we might find something more restrictive than this. But this is sort of the least restrictive of all the constraints. Okay. Well, it comes it comes from being required to live in this in this region. And in fact, if we calculate, you see, if we calculate this, we won't find that the imaginary part is zero. Okay. In fact, what's happening is in this two to two, it's moving up here along the edge of the circle. And it's, well, actually, I don't know exactly what trajectory is, but the imaginary part is not small when we get into this so range. But this thing, but this thing, when we integrate over these intermediate states here, this will have, sure, yeah, sure. yeah. Right. So, well, as we'll see, this was, this was meant to, to show you that the naive perturbation theory is not what's doing it. In fact, there is a perturbation theory that's breaking down, and we'll see, we'll see that. Uh, in just a few minutes. And that is purely real, yes. Um, yeah. yeah, so one could do a refined calculation and get a slightly stronger bound, but this illustrates that there's, there's definitely a problem, no matter what would happen to the imaginary part. Okay, now the longitudinal we can figure out what that is because we know the, so that's easy to see. So in a general, in a general frame, K is the energy we boost along the Z direction. And so the longitudinal, so the transverse ones, when you do a boost of a, of a um, space-like vector, in a direction transverse to the space-like vector, the space-like vector doesn't change, so those are unchanged. But the longitudinal part is changed, because that's part of the, it rotates the space part into the time part. So using this orthogonality condition, this is the longitudinal polarization vector. But we can note that this is approximately k over m plus something of order m over e. So for large boosts, when E is much bigger than M, it's dominantly, it's something that's almost proportional to the four vector, divided by the mass. So in particular, these components here get very large. So there's some components when we were plugging in. So the reason we can see what's happening is, it's not the transverse polarizations that are causing the problem, it's the longitudinal ones. Because when we plug them in, these interaction vertices here, there are secretly powers of momenta and that's where the, the powers of momenta came from, for the amplitude to grow. Okay, so the culprit are the longitudinal polarizations. So the problem really is with the longitudinal scattering, so we can focus on that. Um, in addition, since it's in the longitudinal uh, W boson scattering, it's in the, if we think of what the intermediate state and what channel we're scattering in, that's a spin zero channel. And if we inspected further uh, WZ and ZZ scattering, we would find that under the SU2, it's in the isospin of SU2 zero channel. So the problem is in the scattering of these longitudinal bosons in the J equals zero, I equals zero channel. Okay, so now let me address the gauge symmetry. So I just brutally set the, just turned on some mass terms and started calculating. Um, and so let's see whether the gauge symmetry would make any, would change, change the results at all. 
Well, now, the first thing to note is, as was already noted, uh, already noted in, in the previous lectures, gauge symmetry, from a modern point of view, is not a fundamental principle. It's just a tool that we use to describe um, massless spin one fields, uh, spin, with spin one or higher fields, um, if we require a local Lagrangian description. And so that may not be necessary. There might be other descriptions of a theory, for example, just in terms of scattering matrices that don't make uh, reference to a local Lagrangian. So there's been lots of progress on that recently by Nima and others, um, particularly in maximally supersymmetric theories, trying to develop a full description of at least all the, all the scattering amplitudes <coughs> in terms of something that doesn't make reference to a local Lagrangian. And so that may be one reason that we don't have to worry so much about gauge symmetry, but since for this discussion we are using a local Lagrangian description, let's, let's address the problem of the gauge symmetry and see what happens. Okay, so we wrote this gauge in the usual local Lagrangian description. We, we wrote this, this is clearly not invariant under gauge transformations because the gauge fields shift inhomogeneously under gauge transformations. But we can add a completion by introducing new fields and then arranging that the transformation of the fields is such that gauge symmetry is restored. So we can do that by introducing a field sigma. Fill out an SU2 matrix, so this can, so this is a two. Well, I'll tell you here in a second the transformation properties. So this is a um, matrix, and if we write the following term. where D is the usual covariant derivative. Then this includes a term V squared over two. Plus other terms. And to make it gauge invariant, we have to define the gauge transformation, so sigma is a bi-doublet of the SU2 left gauge symmetry in the standard model times another SU2 where the hypercharge symmetry is the, um, in the Carton subalgebra of the SU2 right here that this sigma transforms under as a bi-doublet. So sigma transforms in the following way. And then the gauge fields, all the gauge fields transform under the usual gauge symmetry. Plus okay, so we can think of this just as an auxiliary um, prescription that we've, we, we started with a term that broke gauge symmetry. If we repackaged it like this with this particular field, and I should say here that the number of Gs we have to introduce here are three. So there are three of these Gs. So not coincidentally, one for each mass of gauge field. And that gives us a mass of gauge field plus some other terms. So now let's return to the WW scattering. So what effect does this have on the calculation that we did before? <coughs> well, you could say, yes, there are some other fields, and they even have derivatives, so they can propagate, at least on internal lines. But we can, um, we can fix a gauge, in particular, if we work in unitarity gauge. <coughs> 
then in that gauge, these fields G can be set to zero. They don't propagate in that gauge. And it just reduces to the previous calculation. So it wasn't gauge invariance that was the problem in the previous calculation. Even though we were just bold and brutally wrote down the, the um, mass terms for the gauge fields, well, here we've restored gauge symmetry where there is some particular gauge where you can just set these to zero. And so at tree level, it's the same calculation. So that was not the problem. OK, so let's go one step further back and consider this uh, limit. This g squared to 0, so that was 1. So let's reconsider this limit, mw squared to 0, with g squared over mw squared fixed. Well, in that limit, let's see what happens. Well, the gauge kinetic term for the gauge field if we write the covariant derivative like this with a canonical normalization for the A field, it's often convenient to do that to put the gauge coupling in the kinetic term for the gauge fields rather than in the covariant derivative. So in this case, we see that when we send the gauge coupling to zero, that's like a very large um, coefficient for the kinetic term for the gauge fields. And so what that means is it costs a lot of action to put um, fluctuations in the gauge field. And so the larger this coefficient is, the more and more damped the fluctuations are. So the limit that we send g to zero, the gauge fields can't fluctuate at all. So basically, they don't do, you don't have to integrate over them. They don't do anything in this g goes to zero limit. Equivalently, if we had put the g in the covariant derivative, then when we sent g to zero, it's just an uncoupled sector that you integrate over, but it doesn't have any effect. Uh, on the rest of the theory. But for our calculation here, it's useful to take this, uh, this limit. OK, so if we do that, we freeze, the, freeze or decouple the gauge fields, then what are we left with in, this, um, in our local action when we do that, when we take this limit? Because we ought to be able to see, uncover the physics of what's happening from taking this, by looking at some of uh, the action uh, that describes this limit. So when we do that, again, in either way of thinking about the gauge interactions, what we're left with is, well, the usual standard model plus this term. But now we can just forget the gauge fields. And so now we should recognize what this is. Um, this is just, this term is a leading order expansion in a derivative expansion that describes the interactions of Goldstone bosons for spontaneously broken global symmetry. And the sigma field in this limit is just the order parameter for the breaking of the global symmetry, spontaneous breaking of g to some subgroup. And these g alpha, these fields that we had to introduce to restore gauge invariance originally, <coughs> uh, they parametrize the vacuum manifold m, which is g mod h. So g here is the original SU2, so this is So the original group, there's a global symmetry in this limit. It's SU2 left times U1 hypercharge, and it's broken down to some U1 subgroup. And while well, that was chosen here so we could get three massive gauge bosons, that's why, this, that's why I chose this particular representation. Um, but here, it's, there are four generators in this group and one here. So there are three broken generators. There's one for each Goldstone boson. And the order parameter that signals the fact that the, that the global symmetry is in the broken phase is sigma. It's non-zero. And the motions on the, so the, the, by definition, the energy is constant. The potential is constant on this vacuum manifold that describes motions around the, this coset space. So that was in the case G 
exactly zero. Now this low energy theory, again, if we think about this as a g equals zero, for any breaking of this, of this pattern of breaking of this symmetry, this is always the leading term in some expansion in the low energy theory. Because in the low energy theory, as you go to lower and lower energy, there are some exact gold stones that are massless. And so you can always integrate out everything else and then be left with a derivative, ex an expansion in derivatives that there's some low enough um, energy scale for which that derivative expansion is good. Okay? So this always becomes a loner description for any pattern of breaking of an exact global symmetry. And, this, and again, this lowest order term becomes good for low enough energy. At higher energies, the higher derivatives would become important. And well, we'll discuss those in a second. OK, so now you can see that when we took this limit of g squared to 0, mw squared to 0, holding the ratio fixed, um, and we solve this uh, bad behavior, now we can see what the bad behavior comes from in this other description. In this other description, this is a limit where the gauge symmetry is ungaged. It's just a global symmetry. And it's just the scattering of, a gold, of the Goldstone bosons. And now we can even see explicitly the powers of, of momenta, because here when we expand, when we expand these terms here for the Goldstone bosons, there'll be some for Goldstone interaction because of the nonlinear realization of the symmetry in sigma. And it has um, two derivatives in the amplitude. So if we consider the scattering process of Goldstone bosons in this um, global symmetry limit, then we can calculate the scattering partial wave in the zeroth L. And we find exactly the same result. Once we make identification with what the W mass used to be, well, sorry, from, we had the W boson mass from the, from the extra term. And we get exactly the same answer. And so we see that, that um, physically, what's happening is that the scattering of gauge bosons at high energies, two to two scattering, physically, that leading term is coming from the Goldstone component. Well, it's exactly the same answer as the scattering of two Goldstone bosons in a theory that just has a global symmetry. So this is an example of, so this can be made precise um, in this way, for example, by looking at the small g limit. Uh, this equivalence between the properties of massive gauge fields and Goldstone bosons and high energy processes. So that's called the equivalence theorem. So we can write the, so the theorem states if we have any amplitude for any process plus some number n of longitudinally polarized, for example, W bosons, that's equal to the amplitude the same amplitude in a theory without the gauge symmetry but with the global symmetry for n Goldstone bosons up to corrections of order m squared over some appropriate invariants made out of the x's and the, and the g's. And so this term goes to 0 as g goes to 0, and then they're the same. We could have anticipated this from, the, from this expression here for the polarization tensor, because we can see that to leading order, the polarization tensor for the longitudinal gauge boson can just be replaced by k over m. But in the Lagrangian, that's like replacing a by 
over m times the derivative of some field. So the derivative gets converted to a k, and so that's another way to write down a theory of Goldstone bosons, take a gauge theory, take the most general gauge theory, and make this replacement. OK, so this is the origin, this equivalence theorem is one way to understand the, the, uh, this terminology of the, of the gauge fields, massive gauge, spin one gauge fields, eating Goldstone bosons. So technically, really what it means is that the properties of a massive spin one gauge field in the high energy limit are the same as the Goldstone bosons. Um, <coughs> and that's where that comes from. And in terms of the polarization states, if the field had been massless, it only has two polarization states. So it's this extra field here, the Goldstone boson, that lends itself to getting another polarization state, but un it also lends itself all the properties of its interactions. So now we can understand the origin of this growth of the amplitude from this leading order term here um, and what it means. So, of course, in the full theory, there's no violation of, well, if you had a full theory to calculate with, there'd be no violation of unitarity. And if you looked at the amplitude, so your amplitude um, <coughs> in, the, in the Goldstone theory as a function of s, well, for small s, this leading term would be the most important. But once s became big, and this gives some estimate of what the scale is, so here's this, so if we look at the real part of s, here's this bound, and so what we got here was just extrapolate this, and we found some scale. And so a good estimate, since this is a power expansion in the momenta, is that something will happen of order of the scale, and it, it, of course it won't violate unitarity. Um, it'll do something. This amplitude has to do something in a full UV completion of the theory. But there is an interesting scale. And by definition, the interactions near the scale are becoming strong. And again, by definition, the interactions at low s are weak because the derivatives are small. So for example, the scattering of, of pions has exactly this feature. At very low energies, pions are weakly interacting, almost point-like particles with very tiny interactions. But as you increase the interaction energy, the square, the s in this process, Eventually, there's some scale at which the interactions become strong. The high order terms are important. And you can estimate that scale from, uh, in terms of this, uh, this calculation here. OK, so what is this description that we've been giving here? So this goes under the name of a nonlinear sigma model. So a nonlinear sigma model is, is just the, it's just this description of a spontaneously broken global symmetry. It becomes better and better at low energies, but when energies reach this interesting scale, then it can't be a complete description, presumably. We can even see that just from the construction, because the only fields that are included in the nonlinear sigma model fields are the ones that parameterize the vacuum manifold. So that corresponds to freezing all the other fields in the theory that would, in particular, that correspond to um, fluctuations of the magnitude of the order parameter that broke the symmetry, spontaneously broke the global symmetry. So now we understand that, uh, so that's another way to understand what's happening in the gauge theory calculation. When we just wrote down this leading term, well, one way to get a massive gauge field is to write down a nonlinear sigma model, gauge it, and then there'll be massive spin one gauge fields. And that should be a good description at low energies, where all the interactions in the Goldstone sector are weak. OK, so now we haven't said anything about Higgs boson yet. So where does the Higgs come in? And note that in particular, for, to restore gauge symmetry, or to talk about the unitarization of the scattering amplitude, we don't have to talk about the Higgs boson at all. 
but let's introduce a um, framework where there is a Higgs boson. So the Higgs boson, what is the Higgs boson? The Higgs boson is an answer to what has to happen um, at or before this interesting scale at which the Goldstone scattering becomes strongly coupled. And so to see that, we can introduce a linear sigma model for spontaneously broken global symmetry and then gauge that. So in this language I used here, the linear sigma model is very easy to describe. The sigma field now, rather than having a fixed magnitude for the order parameter, we can let, if we let that fluctuate, so H or the, so V is the constant expectation value in the vacuum, H are the fluctuations. So now we have four total fields in the order parameter. There's H and the three gold stones. And now if we do a calculation in this, in this theory, if we start with this linear sigma model where the order parameter can fluctuate, gauge the global symmetry, and then redo our original question for the scattering, well, the same diagrams are there, but there's now additional diagrams for the exchange of this Higgs field. So they look like this. So there's S and T channel exchange of the Higgs that have to be added. <coughs> and now, adding these diagrams to the original ones, um, oh, and I should say, yes, and we have this plus a mass term for the Higgs, so we should add a mass term. So if we do that and do our original calculation, which again just corresponds to this in the global limit, this leading order term, then the answer we get for the amplitude in the zeroth partial wave is minus m Higgs squared over, let's see. V squared, and if we use our relation for V to make it look like, and G squared and MW like the, old, like the other calculation, then it's this. Okay, so what, introducing this extra field, so we allowed the order parameter to fluctuate in, the, in this global linear sigma model. We can see what happened. Well, now this divergence got cut off by the Higgs mass. And so these extra diagrams here came in and um, cut off the divergence. And as we said before, the problem was in the J equals zero, I equals zero channel, and that's exactly the quantum numbers that this order parameter fluctuating has. It doesn't carry any of the global quantum numbers. It has no spin, and it doesn't carry any of the, it doesn't transform under any of the global symmetries. And so it came in exactly, and it's, it's the S-channel diagram that's the one, and this diagram then, when you add this, that has a divergence that cuts off the um, divergence and at the Higgs mass scale. Okay, so the divergence is cut off. So what is the Higgs boson? So the Higgs boson is an answer to what kind of physics there could be. Well, now we know where it is. It's at 125 GeV, plus or minus a GeV. But it's what, it's an answer, it's this linear sigma model answer to uh, what can cut off the divergence. Now an important point about this is that the smaller 
MH is, the more weakly coupled Theory, this linear sigma model theory is at the scale at which this divergence is cut off. In other words, it never gets, it never gets uh, very big. So here, if we look at a process like this, in the linear sigma model, then, um, uh, well, at high energies, there's no, there's no scatter, there's no, um, there's a resonance, sorry, there's a resonance, so let me, let me, yeah, I'll just draw it over. So there's some narrow resonance. As the Higgs, if the Higgs is very light, there's a narrow resonance, and that cuts off the divergence. And, and the lower the Higgs mass is, the lower and lower scale this happens at. And the lower the scale it happens at, the more weakly coupled the interactions of the Goldstones are in the global limit. So a light Higgs means that the entire description never becomes strongly coupled in this linear sigma model description. Yes? Oh, oh, this, this turnover? Ah, so this, the straight line that goes forever is just for this leading order term. But eventually you'd have to add, the, the higher order terms would not become small in a systematic expansion. And so in any physical system that satisfied unitarity, like pion scattering, it has to look something like this, okay? So the answer for, the, for QCD, for, for, um, which does spontaneously break, in fact, QCD is described by exactly the same theory at low energies as we wrote down here for the sigmas. It spontaneously breaks an SU2 times SU2 to a diagonal SU2, which if we only gauge a U1 subgroup of, of the right-handed SU2 is exactly what's happening in the standard model. Um, the answer there is, well, it's not a, a linear sigma model with a light Higgs boson is not a good description of that. Um, it just goes and, and turns over. And in fact, this turnover, you could say, well, that something happens in the j equals zero, i equals zero channel. And so if you want to call this turnover a particle, you know, I mean, it'll, it'll go up, and if it comes down, you can say, aha, there's a bump. You can do that. And in fact, in QCD, there's a particle called the sigma, or the F0, that for a very long time was not in the particle data booklet, um, because people say, well, it's not a particle, because its width is... I mean, it's, it's not a nice narrow resonance. And if you look it up now in the particle data group, it just says, for mass, it says 400 to 1200 MeV. Okay, so it's a very broad thing. So something happens in that channel, this, this can't go on forever, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a narrow resonance. Okay? So in this case, the theory by definition is becoming strongly coupled when it gets near this line. For the linear sigma model case, it never gets... This can be as low as you like in principle. It never gets, um, uh, it never gets strongly coupled. And as Nima mentioned, and I think maybe Natty, since now the Higgs mass, I'll quantify this in a few minutes, Higgs mass is so small, it's not that much heavier than a W or Z mass, then the couplings in this linear sigma model description uh, are never big. So the Higgs sector, at least for this, for this Higgs excitation has weak couplings, experimentally, in the electroweak sector. But for example, not in the QCD sector. Ah, and just to make contact with, yeah, I think we can erase this. So let me come over here. So just to make con contact with notation that you're probably more familiar with, Well, what do we gain by going to um, this linear sigma model description? Well, first, the, in the, on the thing I just erased, in this nonlinear sigma model description, the Goldstone's fields, the only fields that we had to add to restore gauge invariance, transform inhomogeneously under the uh, symmetry transformation. But now, since we have, since we added one extra field here, the modulus of the order parameter, there are now four fields, and now that provides a linear representation. 
of the global symmetry. But in our case, I'll just write it with the case we're interested in. And so to make contact with what you're familiar with, if we write, so now there's four degrees of freedom in the sigma matrix, four real degrees of freedom. So we can write them like this, where H minus is the conjugate of H plus. So H zero and H plus are complex fields. And now if we write H as H plus H zero, so if we repackage the sigma into this thing, then this is a two, one of SU2 left times U1 Y. So in usual notation, this is, this is what's called the Higgs field. So it's an SU2 doublet and it has hypercharge one, plus one, in a normalization where Q is T3 plus a half Y. And so now, in terms of these fields, this thing getting an expectation value can always be brought to some form where you, say, put it in the upper or lower component by convention. It's usually put in a lower component. And then you can see that there's one generator left over of the original four here, which is this Q, which is T3 plus a half Y, that uh, Q acting on this in the vacuum is zero. So that's an easy way to see that there's one unbroken symmetry, or one, gener one linear combination of the generators left over that's unbroken. So in the gauge case, that corresponds to the photon. And then when we, us when we expand, here you usually do an expansion in rectangular coordinates. So you write this as so in terms of the goldstones. We can expand the H field like that. This is just a rectangular coordinate system, and the, the one I wrote for sigma is a, is a um, curved coordinate system. Okay. But it doesn't really matter what coordinates you use. Okay, so that's one thing that you buy by going to the, in the linear sigma model. The representations of all the fields now transform under linear representations, not nonlinearly and homogeneously. Um, and because the leading order term now, the, the uh, term with two derivatives becomes a term with two derivatives acting on this H field. So just, again, that's just repackaging what we wrote. <coughs> well now, so the field H, all four components propagate. And so in the usual scale, it has usual sc uh, scaling dimension under scale transformations of one. And so, unlike the nonlinear sigma model, um, the other thing the linear sigma model buys is that the um, action can be truncated at the renormalizable level. So, if we write the general potential, well, so to be invariant, it has to be uh, some function of. Um, H dagger H, that's, a, that's invariant under the symmetries. And so in principle, we could write anything out we like, but if we truncate this at the normalizable level and just assume that the next scale for these other operators is very high, then it becomes a renormalizable predictive theory. And to get the theory in the case where the gauge boson is massive, we just need the minimum for the H field in the global limit to be non-zero. The other thing to note that is if you, if you truncate at the normalizable level, well, we know what the expectation value, we've known that for a very long time because we know what the gauge couplings are and we know what the gauge boson masses are. So that tells us this parameter V, 
<coughs> so we knew one of these two parameters in the renormalizable linear sigma model. And now we know the mass here, so that's the second parameter, and so now we know both of those parameters. So if there's nothing else in the Higgs sector, well then everything else is that we will ever see at the LHC, in particular, is predicted now. It's, uh, we have all the parameters, all the relevant parameters of the theory. Okay, I just wanted to make a comment about the Higgs phase because this is, I'll do this over here. This is something where there's abuse of terminology even when we're talking, we say things we don't quite mean. So just for completeness, let me just mention that. So for the Higgs phase, well, um, in phasing, condensed matter physics, for global symmetries, we have order parameters that transform under the global symmetry, and then one can ask whether the vacuum state has a non-zero value for some field that transforms under the global symmetry. It does, and you can call that an order parameter, <coughs> but that means then that the acting on the vacuum with the Symmetry transformations, it's not invariant, okay? So there's no, that's a perfectly, so there, for a global symmetry, there's an order parameter, a local order parameter that tells, and if it's either zero or non-zero, if it's zero, you're in the unbroken phase, then the, the um, vacuum is annihilated by all the global transformations, and if not, then you're in a broken phase, and the Goldstones transform inhomogeneously uh, moving you around the vacuum manifold. So one could ask, is there a gauge invariant? So is there a similar thing? Um, so again, if we want to use a local Lagrangian description, we should ask for something that's gauge invariant. Any physical question we can answer has to be answerable with some gauge invariant quantity um, that distinguishes the case when we have a, in particular, so the two cases here, that we could have in our, non in our linear sigma model when we gauge it is that the spin one field is either massless or massive. So often we use the same language that we do for global symmetries. We'll say, oh, okay, there's this field H, the Higgs field, with all four components, and it has its non-zero in the vacuum. We use that all the time in calculation, and so yeah, there's an order parameter for the um, for this breaking, spontaneous breaking of the symmetry of a gauge symmetry. But this is not a gauge invariant quantity, and so you can't have. Um, it's perfectly ha fine to have a gauge non-invariant quantity in an intermediate calculation. We do that all the time. That's local gauge theory, and the local description is is like that. The gauge fields themselves aren't gauge invariant objects. Okay? But any answer to any physical, pro any physical answer has to be gauge invariant. So this is not a gauge invariant um, statement, and it doesn't really have any meaning in a gauge theory. So it's not right, even though we use that language uh, very often, uh, we say, yeah, the order parameter for breaking of the gauge symmetry, that's not really correct terminology. If we turn the gauge coupling to zero, then as I said, that's perfectly okay for spontaneous broken global symmetry. Okay, so you might say, well, what about, okay, so I, I won't, that, that's gauge variance, so that's no good, but what about H dagger H? Then, at least classically, it looks like in my linear sigma model, that would be a perfectly good order parameter. But this order parameter, well, in the quantum theory, it it's just a, it's an operator, it has no quantum numbers, and so it receives quantum corrections. And so in general, it's not zero in either phase. Um, so that's also not a, uh, so even for the massless theory, there's no reason why this should be zero or not in the quantum theory. So these are, these are not order parameters. And um, to get an order parameter, One has to go to a non-local quantity, and what one can do is look at the um, uh, non-local order parameter. 
which is the potential between two points, between two um, sources that we put into the theory. So electric sources in, we can pick a representation, for example, the fundamental representation. So if we pick the fundamental representation that couples to the spin one particle as background fields, and then ask how the potential scales as we move the two um, points far apart. So it's non-local because we, we, it, it's not a local quantity. It depends on uh, both of these points. And then the dependence of R can be used to classify uh, various phases. So for example, if it goes like 1 over R, that can be called a Coulomb phase because the potential has the same form as the Coulomb potential. Something that goes like a constant, in other words, independent of R, well, that's what would happen if the gauge bosons were massive, then the interactions are short range. So if you take the two points far enough apart, then the interaction just go, the potential just goes to a constant. So that one could call the Higgs phase. And if it grows with R, that one could call confining phase. So for example, QCD without any quarks, without any, yeah, just pure QCD um, is believed to have this form for the potential between two fundamental, or fundamental and anti-fundamental electric source. And so the answer is that there is an order parameter, but it's these non-local order parameters. Now these can be written in terms of Wilson loops, so if we imagine um, creating these from the vacuum um, in a, in a, between a source-anti-source pair and then annihilating them at some time in the future, that's a Wilson loop. One can refine this by considering, in particular in the Coulomb phase, um, subleading corrections to this that, that um, are sensitive to whether the coupling is either growing or decaying as one goes to the infrared. One can also um, refine this by introducing magnetic sources, uh, as a Tuft and Mandelstam did, and then that gives a bigger classification uh, of the phases. So that's an interesting subject, but that takes us outside the topic of the course. But I did just want to make this point about this usual language that we use of local order parameter. In the case of the Higgs phase, for a gauge for a spin one field is not quite <laughs> correct. But as long as we know what we mean, I guess it's OK. Uh, so now let me come to the standard model. And just um, say, so, well, we've been talking about the standard model, but now we'll, we'll be more specific even to the standard model. Um, one thing that happens that's a result of the particular representation that this Higgs field that um, is responsible for giving the spin one gauge fields a mass, its particular representation is that this mixing angle that I wrote at the beginning of the lecture between the um, photon and Z boson that gives the mixture of the, of the SU2 neutral SU2 gauge boson and hypercharged boson, that becomes a prediction. And that's because the mass term comes from this, comes from expanding the kinetic term, the interaction term, and the kinetic term. So in the linear sigma model, so this is the, this is the Higgs boson mass matrix when we insert the um, linear sigma model expectation values. And so, for H in the 2, 1 of SU2 times U1, then it turns out that this mixing angle is, well, so it's always a function. So for any representation, it's a function of the two gauge couplings, for the two gauge groups. And in this case, it's this particular function. So G is the SU2 coupling, G primes the, the U1 coupling, and numerically, it's about 0 0.235. Well, in this third decimal place, okay, it depends what scheme we're in at one loop. And in particular, the um, ratio, and so from this follows that the ratio of the W boson mass to the Z boson mass uh, from this mass matrix, to diagonalize it, goes like the cosine squared of theta W. So that's a non-trivial test of 
the fact, well, it's a test of the standard model, but in particular that first it makes this prediction so we can measure the gauge couplings. So in an experiment where you measure the gauge couplings, then using this formula, maybe corrected by one loop, now we know what sine squared theta is. And you can compare that to the ratio of, of two other observables, the ratio of this uh, W and Z boson mass. And so again, from essentially the beginning of the standard model, um, once there was just a little bit of data, it was clear that this was consistent with this particular representation. So that's something, again, that we've known forever, basically, what the representation under the gauge, gauge groups of the, of the Higgs field, this linear sigma model. Thing. And in particular, this ratio, th this, this has been tested so well that if, for example, there's a triplet of SU2, well, if it had an expectation value, so it's in the 3 of SU2, so 3 with, say, no hypercharge, then if there were such a thing in nature, its expectation value, you see, it would give a slightly different function here. Okay, so this, this relation would not be exactly the same. But this is tested so well, so this is, if it's there and there's any expectation value, it would be less than it's the, it's the percent level. I don't know what the number is exactly. It's a few percent. Okay. So we can be very, very confident. Well, we know what the, we know what the representation of the Higgs field is. Okay, so that's all I want to say about the gauge fields and the Higgs boson. So I hope that um, enlightened some of the uh, concepts of the, the Higgs field and the Goldstone bosons, what they're there for, what they do, what features they have, and what the implication is for having a light Higgs boson. So now let's talk a little bit about the structure of the rest of the standard model and how the Higgs sector fits in. So in the Yukawa sector, Um, let's write down the representations of the fermions in the standard model. So there are three generations, so there are three copies of the fermions. Each generation has the same gauge interactions, so it's the same representations. So I'll just write them, for, for that reason, I'll just write one generation. So here are the, so now I've, I've included the, the SU3 color. And so now let me write out the representations here. So this is two, two, one. And the hypercharge, I have to look. Okay, so this is, uh, and I should say that these fermions here, I'm using a notation of vial, two component vial fermions, which is standard. And if you're not familiar with two com, if you happen to be more familiar with Dirac notation, I strongly recommend that you learn two, if you're going to be doing physics in four dimensions um, that's outside QED, you should learn two component vial fermions. Um, and there is a, uh, in, the, in the minimal representation, say the 0, 1 half representation of the SU2 times SU2. So, the, okay, yeah. Uh, and there's a nice, if you're not familiar with this, so I, I, again, strongly recommend you learn it. There's a nice review by Haber, Dreiner, and Martin, where it's a multi-hundred page review and I defy you to find any errors or sign mistakes or I's missing there. So it's all spelled out, and you can, there's lots of calculations you can do. Um, so that's highly recommended. Okay, so for these two component vial fermions, these are the representations. This is in um, mostly standard notation that goes back to, I don't know when, late 70s or early 80s maybe. And it's a little bit redundant notation. The, Fields that are capitalized are SU2 doublets. The lowercase fields are SU2 singlets. And just to make sure you didn't miss it, they're also written bars over them. 
but the bar is not like a conjugate, it's just a prime. So it's just redundant notation for lowercase. So if you don't like bar, you don't have to write the bars, but that's, that's. Um, well, no, but if we just wrote, if we just understood that lowercase were SU2 singlets, that's the redundant part. Um, oh, thank you, oh, thank you, yes, and I'm about to do that, I think, yes, okay, thank you. And then, and then the, um, good, thank you, yeah. And then the bars are not redundant, very good. <laughs> yeah, so some people don't like the bars because that implies too much conjugation to them, so some people write tildes. So a as you like, you, you should be notation independent and just learn to absorb anybody's notation, but this is, this is, uh, in my lineage, this is the notation. Okay, now the important thing about these representations are that they're chiral. And what that means is that it does not allow, so the gauge symmetry does not allow, so there's no gauge, and Lorentz invariant bilinears in the fermion fields. So if we didn't have any gauge interactions, we can always write a term psi psi for vial fermions. Here, I'll write the, so if we write an alpha, so the two component, I'm going to suppress the alphas from now on, okay? But, so that would set, that's Lorentz invariant, that's fine, and it could be one field in a diff, one field with itself or one field with a different field. But for these particular representations, there's no, there's no field you can write itself because they're complex representations, so that's not gauge invariant. And you can I, do the exercise. There's no combination of any of these two you can put together to make a mass term. So the standard model, just with the gauge interactions and the fermions is a chiral theory. The fermions are, are exactly massless. Um, and there's no, there's no, uh, perturbative quantum corrections to that statement, just because there's no operator you can write. But we, I just argued here, we know what the Higgs field is. It has to, in this linear sigma model description in the global limit, we know it has to be there. It's a good description for a light Higgs boson. Anyway, this order parameter, again, in the global limit, um, should be there. And we know what its transformation properties are. And it has just the right transformation properties to allow most of these fermions then to gain a mass in the vacuum where the um, Higgs field is non-zero. And so if we take the representation of, of the Higgs order parameter, then these are the terms that can be written. They're all renormalizable terms. So I and J now are the flavor indices, and these are the Yukawa couplings. So there's a coupling of the Higgs field to the up quarks, we'll define what HC is in a second. Okay. Where HC is sigma 2 h star. Okay, so this is gauge invariant. This is gauge invariant except if we didn't have the C here for the hypercharge. So if we take the conjugate representation, that still transforms as a doublet of SU2, but now it has opposite hypercharge, and so that's required for the down-type quarks and leptons. And so now when we put the, um, when we go to the, Vacuum, again, by convention, we usually put the um, expectation value in the lower component. Then um, what we find is that in the vacuum, then This pairs up the up and down type quarks and the leptons. 
So the up quark gets paired, the U, the upper component, again, in, in with the standard convention, gets, con gets paired with a U bar into a mass term from the V, and the down type similar from this, and the lepton from this term. So if we count up, there are an odd number of fermions per generation, and all of them but one, namely the neutrino, um, can be paired up through this interaction with the Higgs field when it has an expectation value. So the different chiralities that have to mix with each other in order to get a massive fermion, that mixing is, is not allowed in the, if the gauge symmetry is realized linearly. If it's realized nonlinearly, namely there's an expectation value for this field, then um, they can mix and pair up into uh, massive Dirac fermions. Uh, Dirac under the unbroken symmetry, namely electromagnetism. So a couple comments about this. So first is, there are many amazing things that happen just in the minimal standard model with this one Higgs field. And we see one of them here. And that is that when we go to the mass basis, so in general, these are, these are general matrices, but we can always do flavor rotations on the quark and lepton fields. And so that's a biunitary transformation on, the, on these Yukawa couplings. So in a mass basis, we make those diagonal. And in the mass basis, we can just see by eye here that the Higgs coupling then is diagonal in the mass. So in the Higgs sector, there are no flavor changing neutral currents of the Higgs field. In other words, this goes like the delta function in the mass basis. Okay, so there's no flavor changing neutral currents um, in the Higgs fermion couplings. The interactions are sim di diagonalized simultaneously with the mass masses. Notice that's not the case in general if you add an extra Higgs field. So many extensions of the standard model have a second Higgs field. And in general, then, if you just wrote down the general term, then, well, there would be terms like this for each Higgs field. And um, if the masses are not aligned with the expectation values, which they're not in general, then the physical Higgses would not couple proportional to the masses and there would be flavor violation. So there's something called the Glashow-Weinberg condition. That ensures that with a second, well, with more Higgs fields, and that condition is that a given Higgs field only couples to a given type of fermion. So one Higgs field could couple to, say, up quarks, another to down quarks, and a different one to leptons, or in any combination you like. And then if you do that, then um, no matter what rotation the physical masses are of the original Higgs fields, since there's only one type of interaction, it gets, all the interactions get diagonalized with the mass matrix. In particular, in supersymmetry, um, as you'll hear probably in later lectures, I'm sure, there is a second Higgs field required by supersymmetry, and so um, you might worry that there'd be large flavor change in couplings in that case. But it turns out in the supersymmetric limit, supersymmetry comes to the rescue and forbids the bad couplings. And so it does satisfy this glashow weinberg condition. Okay, so that's one of the special features of the standard model. And if you start extending the Higgs sector, um, well, either you have to arrange that these are small enough or that for there's some good reason why this glashow weinberg condition is satisfied. Another comment is that the values of the Yukawa couplings determine the masses, because there's just, again, if we just have the single linear sigma model, and these range from, for the electron, 10 to the minus, these are dimensionless numbers, 10 to the minus 5 to the top quark, it's 1. So there's a huge range of these magnitude of Yukawa couplings. Um, since they were normalizable parameters, they do have interesting structure, as was mentioned in earlier lectures. 
Um, <clears throat> the first two generations are pretty well mixed, but they don't mix much at all with the third generation, and the first two generations are much lighter than the third generation. So there is, there is a pattern there, it's a very striking sort of pattern, um, but since these are um, were normalizable parameters, um, even if there's some underlying physics that creates that pattern, it could be at any energy scale. Okay. So in a standard model alone, there's no under, they're just free parameters and there's no a priori um, UV understanding of where they come from. Oh, and the final thing I wanted to say is, well, there was this poor, the poor neutrino didn't have a friend to pair up with, okay? Um, from renormalizable interactions, but um, it can pair up with itself because it's un in the low energy theory with electromagnetism unbroken, there's nothing that forbids this term. And there is such a term, but it's second order in the Higgs field. So f neutrinos can get a mass from terms of this form. This is a dimension five operator. These are fermions, so these two are three, and the Higgs is four, five. So it has this scale here. And the scale for these, now we don't know the neutrino masses, we know their, the difference in mass squared pretty well from the, for, for most of, yeah, we know those pretty well from the oscillation experiments. That's another one of those things that we knew nothing about when I was in your place. Now we know extraordinary details about neutrino mixing. But from that, if the masses are of order, the differences in, if the, there's no huge hierarchies, then these lambdas are um, less than about 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 15 GV. So the scale here points to some very high scale, but extending the standard model by these, not, so this is the leading non-renormalizable operator actually, by dimension counting in the standard model, so it's dimension five operators, and they do give neutrinos a mass. So the analogous picture here is that there's some interaction that couples at second order with the Higgs condensate that allows the neutrinos to get a Meyer on a mass. And, oh, thank you, yeah, this is six. So we don't know what the lambdas are, so we don't know what the mass scale is. But that combination, again, if the splittings are, or if there's no huge hierarchies, it's a pretty high scale. Okay, I think I'll do one last thing and then stop. And that is the, um, I'll talk about the Higgs low energy theorem. And then next time we'll use that to talk about couplings. So this is pretty easy to explain. So just take a couple minutes. So um, <coughs> the Higgs field, as we see here in lots of <coughs> lots of equations that I've written, it's an excitation of the expect again in the global limit. It's a good description. An excitation of the um, order parameter that would, in the global limit, would spontaneously break the global symmetry. So if we think about where any relevant momenta for a Higgs, if we want to ask what's the emission of a Higgs, not necessarily on shell, maybe off shell, a very low momentum. So this is a soft Higgs theorem. So if we have an amplitude for any process where, say, we emit one Higgs, we can do any number of Higgses, but I'll just write it for one for simplicity. Well, since the Higgs is just the ex excitation of the expectation value, then if we take the derivative of the expectation value, uh, sorry, the derivative of the amplitude for the process, with respect to the expectation value, and just multiply that by the, the Higgs field, that gives us the amplitude to emit a Higgs field. So let me just draw a picture of that. So here's some process where we want to know the emission of a soft Higgs boson. <coughs> so this is equal to the same process 
with where we just take a derivative with respect to the expectation value and then multiply by the Higgs. So this is Higgs times, times this. Okay. So the physical content of this is what is, the, what is a very low momentum Higgs? So we can think of that as a long wavelength, very low frequency excitation of the, of the um, magnitude of the Higgs field, at least in the global limit. That's a good description. But if it's very long wavelength and very low frequency, then over some small domain, what's it look like? Locally, it just looks like the expectation value is changing very slowly and over a very long distance scale. So that's what this derivative is. Okay. So um, it's an interesting um, soft Higgs theorem. We could do it for emission of any number of Higgs bosons we like. We just take more derivatives in a Taylor expansion. <laughs> So this is useful. We'll use this in the next lecture, probably, <coughs> to discuss the coupling of, of Higgs to uh, other particles. And um, if the Higgs were very light compared to anything inside this blob, then it's good. Or if it's a virtual Higgs that's carrying very small momentum, then this is also good. And so let me just finish by using this to get the couplings to fermions and scalars in the standard model. So we could do that by expanding Lagrangian, but we can use this soft Higgs theorem also. So let's first do fermions. So for fermions, the mass term is of this form. And <coughs> so the derivative of the mass with respect to the expectation value, well, for anything that gets all of its mass from electroweak symmetry breaking, that's equal to m over v. And therefore, the interaction of the Higgs with the fermion, get to leading order, is just that. We can do the same thing for the gauge bosons. So their mass term in the Lagrangian. So again, now I think this amplitude is just rep we can represent that as a as a local operator, where everything, all the momenta are zero. Just a a. And so now here, it's a mass squared, so we have to take a derivative with respect to the mass squared. And so that's now, again, it's, if the gauge field gets all of its mass from the Higgs expectation value, that's 2m squared. And so that gives us an interaction, h m squared over v. So the couplings of Higgs fields to fermions are proportional to mass, and to gauge fields proportional to mass squared. So that's an important feature um, that I'll draw a picture of the data for you next time. And we could do the self-coupling of the Higgs field to itself. So we could start with a term like this. We could just replace the A's with two H's on the blackboard. And then we could ask, well, what's the coupling of, of one Higgs, uh, the trilinear coupling to Higgs? And we would, get, we would get the right answer. And so as an exercise, I invite you to do that um, and compare that with what you get, say, from the renormalizable potential for the self-interaction. So we'll use this, we'll start next time, we'll use this low energy theorem to get the coupling. So here we did it where everything here, we took the momentum uniformly to zero because that's by definition what the mass term is. <coughs> but we can also get the coupling of Higgs fields to photons and gluons. Even though they don't gain a mass, we can still find the leading, uh, leading amplitude. Um, <coughs> Uh, that doesn't vanish at zero momentum, so it has powers of momentum in it, and take this derivative, and we'll, we'll do that exercise next time, and then talk about um, some of the um, context for the Higgs measurements that are, that are being made now and are going to be made uh, at the LHC in the future. Okay, so why don't we reserve any questions or comments for the, for the um, 